Okay, I, I almost everybody back. I will take questions the last 15 minutes before we go to lunch, but not till then. Um, I'm going to describe the expressions of holy language, and then what I would I would like you to do in preparation for this afternoon is um, I want you to focus just on reviewing how you think about your own challenges and the type of vocabulary you use. Like what, what, what I, uh, um, specifically, you're going to list your 10 favorite words for describing your problems. Your 10 favorite words for describing your problems. 10 favorite words. And you do have 10 favorite words. In fact, you know what? Do it now. I'm not going to give you too much time to rehearse because you'll, you'll get clever. Put down the 10 favorite words that you use to describe. And if you need help, describe a problem to someone. You know, like Trump will always say tremendous <laughs> or bigly, huge. huge, right, 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 just a disaster. So you describe, think about how you describe things or phrase, but come up with 10 phrases or words that you use because before we launch into holy language, pay attention to your language. What's your language? How do you phrase things? How do you speak? Put it down. And, and, and then include two routines you go into when you're in a panic, when things aren't happening. Two habits. Like when I'm upset, when I'm upset, I tend to pace. I tend, I can't sit still. It's hard for me to sit still anyway. But if I'm upset, you don't want to be around me. Because I really can't, and I will vacuum you. I will pull out, I will start clean. I really, I become, I cannot sit still. I start cleaning, vacuuming, laundry. Even if I don't have something to wash, I'll start washing things that don't need washing. I'll throw my robe in. I have to keep busy. I have to make my body do things because my mind is absolutely tormenting me. I will go for a walk. I have to stay in motion. I have to exhaust myself because I know what's going to face me. The reptiles are out. And until I can pull the reptiles in, And then the, the second thing I do is I go for sacred literature. And I go for Teresa. She's my go-to girl. Mother Teresa or Teresa? No, Mother <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> Teresa of Avila. Oh, Teresa of Avila. I go to Yeah, Mother <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> no. I need a powerhouse. And oh no, I, I need Avila. You know, when I was writing Entering the Castle, and I was on the seventh mansion, I was coming to the end, and I couldn't bear to, to part with her energy. I couldn't bear it. I, and I sat at my desk. And I said, 
you know, the only one knew that knew only my close friends and you know, obviously my editor knew that I was writing this book. And I stopped for a minute, and I was in such an intimate space with this this saint, such an intimate space. And I said, "What do you look like?" And it was so intimate that I paused and I said, no, 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 no. I do not want an apparition, no, 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 no. And it occurred to me that that could happen. That it was more, it was more the case that I thought an apparition would happen than it wouldn't. And I thought, I don't want anything like that. I just, it's enough for me to know I can feel your grace. I can feel the grace. I feel it because of, of what I feel inspired and that I just want to sit here and constantly feel that grace and I don't want to leave it and nothing makes any more sense to me. I have never wanted to be as close to anything in this universe as I do the grace that I feel when I am in this place. And not even a human being. And about two hours later, the doorbell rang. It was a FedEx, and it was a delivery from someone I did not know, have never met, who was an artist, who said, I love your work, so I'm giving you a gift of mine. I'm an artist. Here's a painting of the two doctors of the Catholic Church, Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena and said, it's based on the only painting ever done of Teresa of Avila. So this is what she looked like. And I took that, and I sat in the living room, and I said, you rascal. <laughs> oh my God. Wow, well done. Well done. How about that? Is that not outrageous? Tell me that's not outrageous. No reason, no reason but, and, 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 and uh, when I first encountered her, you know, when I first was teaching and I, I thought a grand mal seizure was coming on in front of his, you know, a huge room of students. And I thought, oh my God, don't, don't do this to me here because I'll break my neck and I'll fall off the soap. God, don't, 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 don't. And, and then I heard a whisper, and it said, follow me, daughter. And I snapped to it. it, and it wasn't audible this way, it was in, but it's so funny when you have an experience like that, you also know what the experience is, it comes with directions. You, know, it's, you immediately know the source, what it means, who it's from, it's just a package deal, and I, thought and I had no contact you you have to understand I she was not she was disconnected from me I mean I was not connected to her except here's Teresa Vavila's work like I would teach Meister Eckhart's work I mean I've read it I know it but I, there's nothing right and all of a sudden I knew her work I knew it as if I'd been a scholar as if I'd done my doctorate on it it just downloaded just downloaded, and I taught her all weekend. I just, out of my mouth came Avila, and I was listening to myself. I was like observing myself, listening to myself. And, and, I, and, I, and when I went home, I sat for hours thinking, what have you just been through? This is just the experiences you've spent your life reading about. And you just hit, wow, wow. I spent that whole night walking around my house saying, oh my God, oh my God, wow, 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 wow. Then I went upstairs and I, I had been writing this book and I went, wow, wow, delete, delete. 
delete. I'm writing a book with you, Teresa. Delete, delete, delete. I deleted everything I'd been working on for a year, everything, all gone. And then I called my editor in the morning and I said, mm, it's all gone, it's all gone. But I'm writing a book with Teresa Vavala. Well, not quite with her, but <laughs> inspired by her. Well, maybe, but sort of, I feel her. And no, not this way, but no, I don't see her. But I sense, and this is what happened. Hello? <laughs> Hello? And then she says, you tell that nun, you've got a six month deadline and don't be late. <laughs> True story, true story. True story. True story. So I sat down and I said, did you hear that? And I don't hear anything. And I thought, did you hear that? I thought, what have I done? What the hell have I done? I just erased a year's worth of work. And then I had this huge, huge, huge contract in New York. Big. And I walked around my home and I sat in my living room. And I looked at my home. And I thought, Leslie's gotta go tell the publisher, that I've just destroyed a manuscript that they expect in six months because I've had an encounter with a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm so dead. And I thought, if they call back the contract, if they call it back, I have to sell this home. So I looked around, I looked around, and I said, and I actually got on my knees and I said, all right, it's you and me. And I said, God, you take it, but I'm not, I will not release her, so take it all, but I'm not letting go of this. I said, take it all, take it, everything but I will not let go of that. Take it all. And that day, I received a letter, an envelope from England, from England. And I opened it up and it was a bookmark, a bookmark. And I read this book and I couldn't quite read the handwriting. It was, it, she used a fountain pen, and I didn't I, I had no idea who it was from. And I'm looking at this, and she said, I am holding you in prayer. I was told to do that. And I couldn't recognize the last name. I mean, the, the first name at all. But at the bottom of this bookmark, it was where it was printed, and it said Carmelite Monastery. <laughs> Teresa was a Carmelite. But then I flipped it over, and the prayer, with God all things were po are possible, Teresa of Avila. My first message. I, okay. So, yeah, no kidding, right? You want to know the truth? I'll tell you the rest of it. So I work on this book. And the day that it was finished and the manuscript goes to New York, I have to go to Finhorn. And I take off for Finhorn, and I get there, and I'm at the podium, and there's the identical bookmarker. Whoa. And I flip it over, the same handwriting, and I said, all right, all right, all right, who, who did this? Who, and, and what was it on? And the writing said, I've been told I can stop praying for you now. And I said, who is this? Who, I said, I will not teach. I promise you I won't unless whoever this is shows up here. And out comes this beautiful Irish woman. And she says to me, are you done now? <laughs> and I said, she said, with whatever you're doing, are you done? And I said, yeah. 
She said, you know, I tell you something, I didn't like you much. And I'm looking at her, I'm telling you, I'm looking at her like a frigging apparition. I'm looking at her, and she says, but I was told to pray for you, I have to do what I'm told. She said, so you're done. I said, I'm done, all right, goodbye. Oh, and she goes, oh. Was that in six months? Yeah. Oh, wow. And she goes back up, and she's sitting in my audience, and I'm telling you the truth, I'm like this. And I'm thinking, who talks to you? And I thought, who talks to you? Look what talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, honestly, I, I, if I could take you into the back room of my life, right? Wow. Okay. Answer that. Did you write down your... No. You got everything? All your phrases? <laughs> Did you forget? No, you were talking. Oh, right. That's one of your words. Okay. <coughs> what happened to my... Oh, there. <laughs> Denial's a great thing to admit you practice. If you stand by this window, there's food coming in. I'm going to give you one more minute to wrap this up. But it's in, I, I need you to kind of take a look at your words because we're going to go into that in a second. But what I want to share with you is are what the common expressions are of holy language. So you have a sense of how rich in the many ways Human beings express holy language and always have. There are seven core expressions of holy language. The first is the language and wording that we use in sacred rituals. Sacred rituals span the cycle of life from birth to marriage to ordination, last rites, bar mitzvahs, confirmation, all the rituals that are used in all religions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's sacred rituals, uh, exorcisms, you name it, anything sacred. The second is the language of scripture and the many and varied sacred texts of all various traditions, so sacred writings. The third is the language of prayer, inspirational writings of teachers, mystics, poets, writers, whose work is <coughs> devoted to the elevating of lives of people. So. Um, holy language doesn't necessarily have to be like something out of the uh, Bible or the Quran or the, the text. It can also be, like I consider Emily Dickinson holy writing. Some, a, a piece of work that bypasses reason and gets to the soul. Okay. The fourth is the language of sacred music, dance, art, which are the three oldest expressions of holy language. The fifth is action made holy through intention. You know, helping someone thinking, I've got to help somebody, and it's, it's you know, your action is holy because of what the intention is behind it. And the sixth is the holiness generated through the language of action. For example, acts of human compassion, courage, sacrifice, and service to list a few. And the seventh, like people who offer homes to those who have lost their homes through natural disasters or sanctuary or asylum or uh, whatever, all of that is living holy language, providing for others, all of that, anything it, that is an expression of holy. 
But the one that I am focusing on is the language we speak, the words we use, specifically the words that we actually use in everyday life. Um, what, what I believe is happening at this time is all about us learning the power of our language and how that is that every single word we use is an act of creation. Sets in motion, cause and effect, action and reaction. Now, I, yesterday I mentioned that, that um, I became aware quite some time ago and listening to people talking about healing that they did not have the language to heal. That it, their vocabulary the itself was inadequate to manage the challenge they were dealing with. That their phrasing lacked the power and that they when introd when given other language other vocabulary when that was offered to them it they couldn't bring themselves to use it or they found ways they found reasons to not use that word yet I'll give you an example have you thought about forgiving them Forgiveness is holy language. It's one of the major pieces. And many people would say, I've tried, but I'm not ready. I've tried it, it, and they retreat. Now, in order for me to really make this point, I need to do what many people are familiar with, but I have to put, put, show you my one last drawing. And, and these, this is all you have to endure. Oh, this is green. This is all you have to endure is this. But it's important because words have vibration. Words have vibration. And vibration means that it, they have a frequency. And they have healing power and they have destruction power. And if you look at it, that this is the level of lead. This is your laboratory. And this is the level of gold. All right. And this is the personal level. And this is cosmic or impersonal. And this is your inner laboratory. So this is the physical world. And this is the energy, and this is grace. Okay, so this is the world where you have a job. This is the world of your career. And this is the world of your calling or charism. These are levels of consciousness that are, are, can you see? This is cosmic and impersonal, I am. And grace and the word, word calling and charism. I'll put impersonal. No, it's, it's impersonal. Bottom right, job. Oh, sorry. Um, Let's say calling. Yes, next to charism. Charism. Yeah, C H A R I S M. The word de derivative would be charisma. Oh, okay. But char charism, what I mean by charism is the unique grace by which God knows you. You know how they say every, every uh, planet, every, every galaxy has, is known by its sound? You're known by your sound. This is the one note of your soul that no other person has. Are you getting cold? Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, for God's sake, say something. <laughs> Complain! <laughs> You're sitting there like this. I'm watching people with coats on and blankets. I'm thinking, what's the matter with you guys? Learn to complain. What? What did you? Can you explain grace? Okay. Um, could I explain grace? And remember, you need a microphone. Um, but I'll let you off the hook this time. Small question. Um, big answer, small question. Grace is a mystical substance. Grace is a mystical substance. Okay? Grace is a... And it is, you know, holy language that you don't hear used. You know, uh, it's a popular name, but it's, um, and, and grace is this incredibly mystical substance that, it's interesting, that people at the earth level, the first floor, think is like magic dust. That somehow or other comes in and solves problems, it's like fairy dust. But grace is this um, holy light that comes in and it, ah, here's an example. Have you ever had the experience, most people have, of mm, having a heated exchange with somebody and almost saying the most horrible thing but then hearing a voice and it says, are you sure you want to say that? Are you sure? And that, that voice is not you. Because you're the one that wants to say it. So somebody other than you comes in and says, are you sure you want to say this? Because if you do, it's a game changer and it's over with you. It's, you're going to shatter this. So it's over. And that's grace. Grace is that force that makes you do something that saves your life. Or saves the situation. Like it makes you walk out of the room in the heat of anger and then you realize, thank God I did that. I was just about to do the worst thing in the world. So is it like a blessing? Totally. But that's personal. Total, huh? But that's personal. No, it is. I told you, the universe is two things, okay. impersonal and intimate. Okay. Intimate. Grace is intimate. Grace is divine intimacy hmm. in the best moment. And the best kind. Grace is like when you, when you, here's another example of grace. You're reading something and you've read it a thousand times, but one day it reads you. One day it speaks to you. One day all of a sudden it animates and you think, I never thought of that before. And it made sense, and it goes deep. It bypasses your brain, and it goes right to, boom. That's grace. Delivering the mail. Okay? That's how grace works. You know, and, and grace has a, a million types of expressions, but it, it's grace is, the, is that energy that just lifts you out of your unconsciousness to become conscious of the moment or something just a little bit more so that you act out of character or a little bit more consciously in that moment, but the consequences are huge, profound, life-saving, that's grace. And when you look at consequences, you think, 
boy, considering how small this action is, look what happened. It's like the little bit of seasoning that seasoned, it's like the two fish that's fed a million people. That's the power of grace. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? All right. So, um, do you know what I want you to do? I want you to share your um, words, your favorite words with everybody else. I want you to share how you speak and how you think when you have, when you have obstacles so that you can see if you've really drained yourself. And as you do, pay attention to how much is not sacred and how much is and how you phrase things. Well, I want you to see how you speak to yourself. And I hope at home you're kind of, you would do the exercise with us, actually. And even if you're listening to this alone, that you would take the time to do it alone. That you see how you frame your thinking. And whether or not you incorporate holy threads or fatal ones in your thinking. Whether or not you involve your soul or just your mind and how you kind of phrase things. And, and, and when I ask you to do these exercises, don't just do them for this room. Do them the way you actually are. Especially if you tend to be like pessimistic or when, when, when things don't go your way, or when you have a problem, you think this again, or does it drain the life out of you? Does it make you feel depressed? I mean, how, how do you respond? When things, do you blow up a problem and think, oh my God, this is just the worst thing ever? Do you see what I'm, I'm asking you how you engage when an obstacle comes in your life? Does some, do you have to, to, to work your way all the way up from the bottom again, or are you resilient? The grace of resilience. Or is, does, th do things overwhelm you easily? This is, and, and I ask you this because grace is an active principle. It's an active force. It, 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 the, that presence of the holy is a constant. But when, <clears throat> when we exit out in our lives, how we respond in our lives is that every problem feels like a concrete wall. Is that we always feel, that, not always is a big word, but we tend to feel alone, we tend to feel that every problem has the potential of wiping us out, draining us, hemorrhaging, scares us to no end. And that's the kind of language we use. It's the kind of language of the first column. It's fatalistic. It is heavy, it's dense. And it's the vocabulary of the first column. And, and when you use this vocabulary to say to someone, as I have had the conversations for years and years and years and years, and I tell people, you have to pull up the anchor and let go of that. Letting go is a concept, a capacity, that someone who has a lot of lead can't comprehend. They can't do. They, they, they are so de-energized. They are so, it's, it's a letting go is, is because this, this level of consciousness makes more sense to them that holy language of forgiveness, because what makes more sense 
is that they have vengeance. They are looking for righteousness. And that makes, that consciousness makes more sense than the elevated holy consciousness. They can't get to this language. This, this language is too bright for their eyes, too much for their head, too much. This is a, this is a really big deal to get because words have that much power. And what I've realized is, have you ever said to someone, have ever had a conversation and they've said something to you and you know they didn't mean what they said? That they were just saying something. How did you know they didn't mean what they said to you? How did you know it? No power. Just okay, no power? What? You feel it. It's like you feel. Okay, but what do you think you were feeling? Wait a minute. I need, I got to have this on, on. Would you repeat that, please? You just get a, a hit, a feeling that there's nothing sincere in that tone of voice. That okay. You, you, you felt the absence of sincerity. Yes. Okay, and Nancy, what did you feel? Wait, I have to have this book here. Oh, okay, I just said there was no power behind the, what was said. Okay, and you felt the absence of power. Mm -hmm. what, else did you, what else would you say? I'm sorry? The body is communicating differently. It's non-verbally different The, the body is communicating a different message. Yes. Okay, so what you're essentially saying, all of you, is that you could feel that there was absolutely no life force coming. Mm -hmm. And you felt it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that you, you're, you're sensing that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but what I bet all of you, the memories that you just hit upon, that you're referring to, have in common is that they were emotional, heart-centered memories about something that broke, <coughs> something physical fell apart in your life. They gave you an emotional memory, which is a higher, they use language like never meant to hurt or something like that. But that language, <coughs> excuse me, that language, because healing language is holy. Because it wasn't authentic, they did not have the spirit to animate it, so they couldn't use it. They couldn't use it. They couldn't animate it. And theref therefore, and you could sense it. You could sense you're just reading empty words, but you can't animate that language. It's sacred. And you're not able to animate it, and I can sense it. Now, I have to hit a, a pause button here and explain something to all of us. What is happening what, is that your inner senses are becoming so refined, all of ours, that part of that is that we're becoming transparent to each other. We are... These senses are opening up. This is what I mean by seeing through the soul. We're becoming transparent. So that the capacity to say to someone something that you don't mean is diminishing. We're not going to get away with it. It's not going to work. Okay? It's, we're, we're, we, we are... What our, our, our most, our physical senses are now going to get relegated to the caboose on the train. And our energetic soul senses are absolutely going to become the engine. So that what we sense and what we perceive, sense and perceive, so what I sense around you and what my soul perceives, because my soul can perceive data. 
what, what is getting revealed. Okay, so my soul has perception. Okay, so I can sense energy, but my soul can perceive. So it's, my, it's through the soul that I perceive instruction for you. I can't sense instruction. I have to perceive that. Percep inner perception is a soul sense. It's a sacred capacity. It's the capacity that if I sat in prayer with you and said, God, can you counsel me for this person? Am I allowed to receive counsel for this person? That's when the grace is given that I can then counsel you on something that I can perceive on your behalf. That is very different than my sensing the energy around someone. Mm. So perception is a soul skill. I remember years and years ago, a, a, a Holy Cross brother saying to me that when he was very troubled, he went back to his seminary to his monastery, and he had a spiritual director there. And he went into the chapel, and he so respected this priest, who was one of those deep mystics. And he was trying to figure out how to bring up, and what it essentially was, was he wanted to leave community. And he was in great grief and great anguish, and, um, so he had gone into chapel and he was deep in prayer and his spiritual director had come in and sat in the back and also went into prayer for him, for him. And deep in prayer, he received counsel for his, for his spiritual directee, this monk. And, and Afterwards, as, as this brother that I knew was leaving the chapel, his director then got up and walked out behind him and said, would you like to talk about your conflict in leaving community? God showed me what was in your soul. And I have the words if you don't. That is soul perception. But, and that is what Holding someone in holiness is how wide your soul can speak. That's what we're capable of giving each other. If you held someone in holiness and said, I, I, I'm going to pray for them, God, talk to me, and be still and hold them. But the, but the, the level of love and trust you have to have is I, God spoke to me for you. And this is very, are you okay, are you okay? This is very different than when someone comes up and says, you know, I, I was guided and I was told that I should work with you. <laughs> this type of soul motivation means I put your needs and I'm not involved in this, but I have, I'm holding you in prayer. The type of <clears throat> impersonal, impersonal prayer, impersonal, that I so, I so honor your life path and how I can serve your life path that it has nothing to do with my life path. I am, if, I, if my soul can hold your life path, that's where I'm coming from. No agenda. No agenda, thank you. Yeah, no agenda here. Okay. So, what I want you to do is find someone you haven't spoken to. Is there anybody you haven't spoken to, guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go find someone and just say, this is how I talk when I have problems. <laughs> this is how I blow off. This is how I speak. 
And, and if you hit panic buttons in terms of, I, I absolutely stop believing in everything, everybody, just pay attention. Go find somebody. <laughs>